Thanks, Daniel. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm glad we're still able to have this session today. Uh, yeah, due to the recent events as a virtual one. So big shout out to Tony and actually uh, everyone from the Spark, uh, Spark Collider team and, and Afrox team. Uh, yeah, really great stuff that you did do like the last few days. Um, short intro about myself, really quick. Second. Um, so I am Toby, a strategy designer with Business Models Inc. Originally, um, I am from Munich in Germany, where I was studying aeronautics and aerospace at the Technical University of Munich. And um, after my studies, um, I started my professional career with Airbus Group Innovations um, as an R&D engineer. And as you can see in the, uh, in the image uh, top left, so it was all about electric aviation, electric aircraft, future of flight. So um, at that time, uh, I was also working with Airbus Group Innovations in the lab, um, working on small scale demonstrators for aircraft icing and de-icing, especially in terms of um, de uh, development of systems that are actually powered fully electrically. So like without the use of any bleed air at all. And uh, in addition to that, um, I was also doing um, material science research, especially for um, anti-ice and also anti-contamination surfaces, as you see in the picture, top left, like all those kind of super hydrophobic and anti-wetting surfaces. And of course, like uh, developing, everything was really geared towards developing systems um, to make aviation, to make aircraft actually safer um, with the intent of fully electric aircraft that you can actually easy, easily de-ice while being airborne. Um, yeah, so in, in parallel at my work with Airbus, I also did do my PhD in aerospace engineering at the Technical University of Munich. And uh, yeah, in addition, uh, like part of my work with Airbus um, was also uh, like intellectual property rights. So I'm the inventor of more than 10 international patents, all on behalf of Airbus, of course, and they're in the field of aviation technologies that enable fully electric flight operations. Um, so after the time at Airbus, uh, I kind of pivoted myself and uh, came to the US and uh, I'm working now with Business Models Inc. And um, we're a strategy and innovation firm specializing in strategy development and also business model innovation. We're global, so we have more than 40 strategy designers worldwide, and uh, we're experts when it comes to engaging stakeholders and also designing sustainable strategies that work. We have offices uh, all over the world. Um, we're headquartered in Amsterdam. Uh, we opened that office in 2008 as the first one. And uh, we also have two offices uh, in, in the US, um, our lead office in San Francisco and also another office in New York. And uh, yeah, we also have uh, more, more offices, um, one in Taipei and also another one in Brisbane. So we're global to really be able to serve um, all, uh, all the markets across the globe, but more with a regional perspective. And ultimately for us, it comes down to understanding the customer needs understanding also the regional market and really knowing what is it that the customer wants uh, and also what is it that they need, uh, how can we help them best. Um, personally, um, I am the global lead of the aerospace, aviation, mobility and transportation practice with Business Models Inc. And uh, as part of my work, I am leading projects in the field of urban air mobility. So looking into concepts as well for management of urban air traffic and also unmanned traffic, drone traffic, but it's also even bigger. So any kind of multimodal mobility and also micro mobility as another topic that's uh, becoming more and more popular, especially in, uh, in the metropolitan areas uh, like San Francisco Bay Area and also all those big cities in the world. And uh, lastly, um, also like getting more and more interest, uh, uh, everything in terms of smart and advanced concepts for, for on ground traffic management, traffic flow optimization. So actually, how can you improve traffic uh, for, for everyone uh, commuting from A to B, um, which of course uh, that, in, that includes uh, demand forecast prediction, uh, minimizing waiting time as you see in that picture, um, bottom right. Also route optimization um, in terms of uh, like how to optimize traffic, uh, traffic light signals, uh, also like speed assignments, all these things are really making city traffic uh, better and uh, of course everything is like geared towards that smart city city of the future efforts <clears throat> so um with business models what we do as a company is we we design but even more so we redesign businesses and everything that we do it's really focused on helping organizations creating delivering and also capturing value 
Um, maybe some of you guys have seen that book, that black book, Business Model Generation. It's our best-selling book uh, nowadays. It's more than 3.7 million copies. Got translated into more than 35 uh, languages in all over the world. And uh, it's definitely a, a bestseller. Like a lot of people that have never heard of us as a company, but they do know the book. And we, Business Models Inc., we're the producer of that book. And of course, like one of the biggest or the, the most popular outcome, it's the Business Model Canvas. Those nine boxes describing the ecosystem of your business in a pretty, in a, in a pretty simple and neat way. We're also the authors uh, of that yellow book, uh, as you see in that picture, uh, Design a Better Business, which is maybe like the more practical uh, framework uh, compared to the business model generation. So that yellow book, Design a Better Business, gives you all the tools, um, all those frameworks uh, when it comes to innovation, when you want to work with groups, facilitating workshops, and really work through anything in terms of how to come up with new ideas, but also how to create tangible outcomes. So you might ask yourself, uh, how, how do we develop strategies and innovate business models together with our clients? Um, so it's never like that we do it everything on our own for our clients. It's really about helping clients, but doing the work with them together and also engaging them. So for us, uh, key in that it's, yeah, of course, it's design thinking. And as you see uh, in that picture, uh, Karl Lagerfeld, uh, um, the designer um, that actually works pretty similar as a business designer. So it's really about like not that very first idea that comes up. This is the one that goes into production. It's an iterative design. It's, uh, it's about pivoting and perseverance. Uh, you never have your first idea and that's what gonna goes into production. So design thinking, um, a lot of you guys, I assume have heard of that. So let's demystify design thinking a bit. What is design thinking? What are those key ingredients of design thinking? So, well, that's just one explanation. It's a human centered and collaborative approach to problem solving, but that is, as I said before, iterative it's also creative and practical and for me like um one of the key uh key elements in design thinking um in my mind it's really those two words that i've shown before it's human centered so basically it's customer centricity um we we need to know what makes our customer tick but also of course this requires empathy and design thinking is a really great tool to dig into that finding out what is it that the customer wants, um, but also ultimately what is it that the customer is willing to pay money for. So for us, uh, and we tell that our clients all the time, three key ingredients in design thinking. It's, as I said before, the customer desirability, but it's also business viability. So do you really make money with that product or that service? And in the end, of course, you need to be able uh, to produce that product. So technical feasibility is also, of course, uh, one of the key elements for uh, for design thinking, making things real. And uh, yeah, even more, even more in design thinking, um, it's not about draw like like design thinking per se, or or about drawing nice and colorful pictures. It's about doing. So making things real, creating tangible outcomes, uh, such as ready to test uh, MVPs, but also prototypes that are ready for customer explorations. So how do we do that? Uh, what are our, our building blocks as a company? Well, of course, uh, it's innovation. So uh, all those tools that we have available, wall of ideas, creative brainstorm uh, techniques that we do, also strategic visioning is, uh, is one of these uh, these parts. So we figure out what are those, those visions that you as a company want to go to uh, in three or in five years from now? How does, how does that align also with your organizational structure? Well, closely connected to the strategic visioning, it's also scenario planning. So what are those scenarios? What if this and that comes into play? So being prepared, not have like only one option, but thinking like, like uh, that foresight mindset, thinking in options and be prepared, whatever comes into play. And um, of course, when we think or when, when we ask companies, so what's your vision in three and five years? We, we also develop and help them. What are those business models? So um, business modeling, uh, value propositions, that's also important that we have those um, in there, aligning that with uh, what are those business models for your future? What are the business models in three to five years? What do you need to do? What do you need to change uh, in, in terms of your business model that you're actually ready and that you get towards that vision? And then since we are a, uh, like creative, a, uh, a creative design thinking agency, so also strategic storytelling, of course, is, it's key for us. 
making everything visual and uh, your your story you can tell that way better uh, not having like tons of pages but having something visual uh anything that actually resonates and everyone actually uh can kind of understand um and of course uh, in that context also prototyping and validation is key for us so coming up with prototypes really quick and be able to put something in front of the customer, talk to the customer, and uh, of course, ultimately to validate or unvalidate with the customer getting the feedback. So what is our approach that we walk through with customers? How, how do we do, uh, how do we demystify uh, the design thinking, all that, all that uh, iterations and, and, and the entire creative approach? For us, um, it always starts with a point of view. So with an opinion that you have. Next, it's about learning. So it's about understanding uh, what is currently happening. What does, how does the world around you look like? What is it also that the customer wants? So it's kind of a customer discovery and we have like a lot of different tools for, for that understanding phase. So this could be uh, the business model canvas, of course, figuring out your current value proposition as a state of the art analysis, but also context mapping, understanding what is it that, that uh, that your competition does what are the, the demographic and also the technology trends at the moment but also in three to five years from now and ultimately of course what i said it's about the customer discovery uh, exploration what is it that the customer wants coming up with personas coming up with customer journey mapping all these things to have a better understanding what's actually currently happening and what are the trends that are happening in the soon enough future then it's about it's about creating options ideating and innovating and definitely do not stop after the first one, have like a bunch of ideas, create multiple options, not that single right solution. And um, with that in mind, once you're there, once you have, uh, once you ideated enough, um, it's definitely, uh, you have an enhanced point of view, but then you're ready, you're ready to prototype. So do something, have something tangible that you actually can show to someone, to your customer. So do those first prototypes as napkin sketches, uh, maybe a simple cardboard prototypes, as simple as possible that you're actually able to validate with your customer in a very, very fast way. So it's about testing those biggest assumptions and yeah, failing is learning. And uh, it's actually even good if you, fa if you fail fast, it's cheap, you learn and you can actually pivot uh, whatever you had in mind. You can pivot your idea. And then, of course, you come back to the center, so you update your point of view. So this is that, uh, that process. We call it the double loop. So it helps us actually um, to go through those phases with our customers. And of course, normally, you never go through that in a linear manner, from understanding to ideating to prototyping to validating and then directly into scale. No, it's an iterative process. So sometimes you might you might have like some three to five iterations in the upper loop, maybe sometimes only one, and there's a bunch of more iterations in the lower loop. So it's never ever a linear process that you go through. So what we ultimately give our customers and uh, what we do with them, we're giving them new tools, new skills, and also a new mindset. And there's a myriad of new tools uh, that we can give our customers. All those C, uh, they align with the, with the four phases that I was talking about before, um, about uh, um, understanding, ideating, prototyping, and validating. But of course, it's also more. So we also say, even in the processes before, for the preparation, we have a bunch of tools, but also for the scaling. Uh, so ultimately, uh, the go-to-market, uh, how can you actually scale your products? Those tools, you can find those tools um, in the book, in uh, Design a Better Business. And um, there's also a bunch of these tools available on our website. So now I do want to talk a bit more about our value propositions, the Business Models Inc. value propositions, the things that we offer our clients to help them innovate and also to stay relevant. So for years, we successfully deploy our commercially viable products to our huge and continuously growing customer base. And uh, so be it strategy design, of course, as a strategy design agency, that's like a lot of what our clients ask for. That's also how they find us in Google or, or wherever. But also co-innovation um, as another of our value propositions, acceleration, and also capability building, as you see um, uh, at the bottom. Ultimately, capability building, that, that in, in, in the meaning of education, like teaching people in trainings, uh, like how to use our tools and also like how to use design thinking, but ultimately how to innovate better. So 
let's deep, deep dive a bit into co-innovation, which is most one of our most appealing and uh, yeah, yet challenging value propositions. So what is co-innovation? Well, for, for many companies, innovation, and in particular, co-innovation, it seems an impossible task, just as the equation one plus one equals three. So we help companies solve uh, this task, innovating directly with, with their partners, also with customers, to creating new innovative offerings that actually exceed the sum of its collective parts. So let me show you a few examples of uh, what we did do in the past in terms of co-innovation. Um, so the whole, the whole term and also our value proposition, co-innovation, it all started with CHILL. Um, CHILL, that stands for Cisco Hyper Innovation Living, Hyper Innovation Living Lab. And uh, that all started uh, in 2017 when, when Cisco approached us and uh, we were talking about how can we actually make things happen like innovation with different companies with giants from the industry. So as you see at the, at the bottom, uh, it was Cisco uh, together with Intel, GE, also with Citibank and the German logistics provider, uh, DB Schenker. So we brought all those guys together in one room in San Francisco uh, in the Palace of Fine Arts. We brought senior leaders of those five multinational organizations together. And we, we helped them go through the process of co-innovation. So from starting with an initial idea, uh, coming to, to pre-concepts, uh, then also doing uh, um, customer, customer validation on the spot, um, getting further into deeper understanding of the customer business modeling, even up to prototypes. And in the end, um, there was a, there was even, even an investor pitch. So we created new innovative offerings all around the topic of securing the digitized supply chain. Another example that I can show you, um, we also did do co-innovation with Chi and Ericsson. And at that time it was, uh, it was about co-creation of a shared vision prototypes and also business models for the future of smart manufacturing. So how could actually these two giants, G and Ericsson, how could they create new innovative offerings around industrial IoT, around 5G, uh, virtual reality, um, augmented reality, and also artificial intelligence? So we business models, um, we designed and also facilitated a two-day workshop together um, with, uh, with GE, with also Ericsson, but then also we, we invited a bunch of hand-picked startups and we were working on, uh, in three groups, we're working on three pitches. Um, we also had a, uh, a uh, investment pitch at the very end um, with the C-suite executives from GE and Ericsson. And um, we, walk, we walked these three groups through a bunch of our tools, through our innovation process with a customer journey, uncovering customer needs, but also of course, doing the business modeling, figuring out what are the value propositions that customers actually are willing to pay money for and we also, for that reason, also did do some customer validation on the spot. And uh, ultimately, we also thought about, okay, what will happen after? Uh, how, how do we actually proceed once we get out of the room? So we also did do game and action plans for, for the next 100 days after that workshop and also designing the go-to-market strategies. And of course, everything needed to be refined after. But in the end, for us, it's not about just designing a two-day experience. Uh, every, everyone is stoked and excited about that, and, and uh, then everyone gets back to normal and everything is forgotten. For us, it's really important like, that also our, like our way of working and also our outcomes are actually sustainable, and there's happening something after. So these outcomes from the co-innovation G in Ericsson, it was basically three business models that were created in those two days. Um, and two of those even got funded uh, in, in the investment pitch. So that was critical asset tracking and also real-time digital quality control. And yeah, uh, GE and Ericsson, um, they're working in a, in a joint venture style still on these two projects and, and also um, bringing them further. And um, the very last example I want to show you in terms of co-innovation, um, it is another chill, um, this time together with Rico, Woodside, and Rockwell Automation. And uh, this chill, we facilitated and ran that uh, uh, last year in San Jose um, together with those four giants. And I want to show you a video so, so you get a bit of a better impression how that all looks like and how does it really look like in reality. We're here in Silicon Valley with four giants of the industry who've come together to partner in the design of industry disrupting solutions. 
we believe the future of Industry 4.0 is actually the connection in between payments and machines. We're talking about end-to-end -end automation, optimized resources, reduced waste, and sustainability. And you kind of see the energy in the room, figuring out solutions to our hard problems that we all have. This is an ecosystem of technology and talent. The pace, the speed, the prototyping, the end users, it's happening in a way that you don't see. The build teams are just the most amazing contribution. They sucked out ideas from our conversation. They stayed up all night, developed a full-fledged prototype. It was a physical manifestation of everything that you've been talking about. All of a sudden, your concept takes life. Having 40 or 50 end users right in our site with us means we can get lots of feedback really quickly. The teams are really operating at the cusp of what's possible right now. It's really where people are going to leapfrog the opportunities in the market. Um, it's absolutely just watching the pressure cooker happen over two days. Coming together like a mosh pit of ideas, but in the end, they all have to agree. So that demo reveal, for a lot of teams, it's make or break. When you have a good idea, bring an end user, and then they chop down 80% of your idea, it really gets you down to the core of what's useful very quickly. What I'm trying to do is help guide them towards creating a better product. We fail forward and look at what it is that didn't work. It makes you reassess. Suddenly the world opens up to you. Often it's that moment that really defines where they're going to bring on stage. Very lightly place we had to pivot. It was the point at which the team came together and we gelled and went, okay, it was a freight train towards the final destination. Over the last 48 hours, we've been through round after round of prototyping and end user feedback. So these teams can be completely confident that the pipeline of innovations are truly market ready. This moment, this is what it all comes down to. Investors, I'd like to ask you, who'd like to support this team as they take their next step? All right. We were very excited. We were very happy with the outcome. Uh, it was like even worse. Oh my goodness. There wasn't one idea that wasn't pitched that I didn't think had incredible value. Yeah, it was, it was so damn good. Yeah. For cash, check, or international wire transfer. <laughs> All right. Chill is about outcomes. It's about building a pipeline that we're going to execute together into the future. Our question to you is, are you in? Okay, so yeah, I, I still think, uh, in my mind, definitely uh, the entire Chill, uh, the Cisco Hyper Innovation Lemon Labs, it's definitely our most appealing value proposition. Really, really challenging. And uh, that pressure cooker, well, if you, as you've seen in the video, like, Everyone is super excited and, and even after, but it, it's really a great project. And also like, it's a total different style of working with companies, working together and bringing like giants from the industry together and co-innovating with them. But big question, why? Why do we all do that? Why is it actually important to, to, to change the ways of innovation and to change the ways of working? So, well, business as usual, business as we know, as we all know business, it's, it's dead. And the world has changed. We all, we all know those appliances from the past, the Game Boy, a Sony Walkman, uh, an old uh, Kodak camera, CD-ROMs, also uh, one of my first smartphones, uh, uh, the Nokia. Uh, we all know those, but nowadays the world has changed. It's all in there. It's all in the iPhone or in a Samsung Galaxy, whatever. So the iPhone or, or any, any smartphone comprises it all. It definitely has changed. And there's many, many more changes around us. Another example uh, for changes in publishing. So we don't carry around books anymore. Well, we just have our e-reader, our, uh, our Kindle, or we read it on our smartphone. Also in ownership, ownership also did change. So we don't own music anymore, going into record stores and buying vinyls or, or CDs. No, we just simply stream media, streaming media and entertainment. We use Spotify listening to our most favorite songs, or we do it in Apple Music any kind of uh, uh, um, uh, streaming services that we actually consume, but it's not about ownership anymore. Also in production and manufacturing, there's a lot of changes. So mass production, we still know that, uh, like same cars all over, but nowadays it's actually hyper flexible micro factories. So customers needs have changed. Customers ask for hyper individualized products. 
And also in public transport is another example. And of course, uh, one, one of my fields that I'm working in and most interested in, well, we all know that example, standing in New York or anywhere in the world, waiting for a cab, uh, it's raining outside. Uh, every every cab, is, a cab driver is busy, so there's no cabs coming. But well, nowadays, we just simply hail a ride. We take our cell phone, uh, go into Uber or Lyft or any other uh, ride hailing service, um, ask for a car, and we got picked up um, at uh, at the spot where we are, and also dropped off uh, anywhere where we wanna wanna get dropped off. Super easy, super convenient. And also the next step of a hailing service, it's almost there. Flight hailing um, as a next as a next stop uh, uh, as a next step. Um, for any kind of service in terms of uh, uh, getting from A to B in a simple and very, very easy way. And uh, yeah, the, you, you might've heard of those so-called flying cars or the more, uh, uh, or the more real um, notion, EV tall, so electrical vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. And there's a multitude of companies who are already working on those EV tolls, startups also of any kind. As an example, as here in the picture, City Airbus, uh, being able to carry up to four passengers um, and uh, Airbus uh, plans to deploy that uh, as of uh, the latest uh, announcements uh, by 2023. But also there's many more companies, as I said, working on that. For instance, the German Volocopter backed by Mercedes-Benz by Daimler. Uh, also Lilium, uh, the guys from Munich. But then also um, top left of the picture, Cora Kitty Hawk, that now has actually a strategic partnership uh, with Boeing, uh, dubbed WISC. And again, um, also Airbus Bahana. While all these demonstrators, uh, all these concepts are, are still not, not ready for certification and also not being ready yet for being deployed. Some of the companies, they also prepare for entry of services off these VTOLs. And they prepare for that with like the common vehicles that we nowadays have to offer flight hailing. So basically helicopter hailing. Uh, just as a few examples, um, and there's even more than those what you see in the slide. Um, there's Uber with Uber Copter offering uh, um, helicopter hailing in New York City, and then also Blade uh, in New York, uh, Los Angeles, in San Francisco, the Bay Area, Las Vegas. Then uh, another Airbus company, uh, Voom in the picture, top left. They offer uh, flight hailing in Sao Paulo, in Mexico City, but nowadays also in, in the Bay Area and San Francisco. And also in Asia, as an example, Ascent Urban Air Mobility offering hailing in, uh, in Manila, in KL, in Bangkok. There's many, many more companies than those. They look already into the third dimension of urban mobility, transporting people easily from A to B and avoiding actually traffic jams on ground. Just a few facts uh, on the company I was talking about, uh, Blade uh, offering flight hailing services in New York, uh, um, as you see in that picture in the example. So you simply book by the seat, uh, well, or you can also get a pass or an annual membership. And I mean, like the convenient part, uh, of course, it's not it's not uh, really cheap, but the convenience it's getting through uh, it's getting from JFK airport to like downtown lower Manhattan uh, in five minutes instead of 40 minutes or even more in an Uber or uh, more than one hour in public transport. So for one hundred ninety five dollars, you, you can get in five minutes from JFK to Manhattan. Pretty cool in my mind. And uh, Blade Day nowadays, uh, well, as of as of March 25th last year. They offer 22 core routes in the US, flying already and transporting their passengers from A to B. So you see, there's a lot of changes happening and, and the rate of change, it is exponential. Those are our requirements. Everything needs to be connected. Smart cities, um, we wanna have smart cities. We wanna have all the information available in the most convenient way. Also smart home, we wanna know what's happening. We wanna switch off our light from our cell phone, uh, uh, switch on the dishwasher having like all the information available in the cloud, um, being able to see what's happening and also to steer everything from the cloud. So yeah, uh, another thing, everything needs to be a service nowadays. And of course, with the advent of cloud, uh, of the cloud computing era, it's been all around us, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. But even uh, today, it's quite natural to us, uh, we require, uh, media or entertainment as a service, as I said before, Spotify or or also Apple Music, mobility as a service such as Uber, Lyft, uh, and also, also all these uh, these other uh, ride hailing companies. Basically, we require everything being a service. And yeah, data data is the new oil. Bringing me to the point, like all those successful companies, those success stories um, from from Silicon Valley, 
what is it that makes these companies tick? But also, what, what is it that makes those companies so successful? Um, in my mind, and also what we found uh, with business models, when we were looking into like, what are those success stories of the companies? They separate search from execution. So execution, that's like exploiting certainty, exploiting your current business model, forecasting, writing plans, and just doing like always the way, like continuing the way you were working, uh, making it bigger and bigger, but just basically really exploiting your current business. But then the interesting part, it's the other side. It's the search mode. Actually search, that's what startups do. They experiment, uh, they set up experiments. They wanna learn, they, as I said before, failing fast. They wanna learn fast also. They, um, they, they cope with uncertainty and they embrace uncertainty. And uh, they don't dare, they don't dare to, to, to get disrupted. So they, they actually, they wanna disrupt before they get disrupted. And industries, they're never disrupted by new technologies alone. AI, yeah, it's cool, but it's on its own. It's simply algorithms, but robots, um, robots are just robots until the point when they get plugged into a business model. So as an example, robotics as a service uh, in manufacturing, helping companies to deal with rising automation and also dealing uh, with tighter global um, competition. So robotics as a service allows companies to use robots uh, for short term needs and that they do not have to invest uh, like on a long term uh, in, in any machines or robots. So they can just simply require those robots as a service, help them with their current peak uh, in, in manufacturing. But disruption, it's never about creating, it's disruption, it's all about creating new business models. It's never about like just finding a new technology. It's creating those new business models um, that, might, that might have like some new technology components and by means of that, uh, you can create those paradigm shifts for industries and also paradigm shifts uh, for competition. So the now, that's where you, where many companies are. And the big question is, of course, how can you get toward the edge of innovation? How can you actually make that shift happen? I want to I wanna talk at the very end part of my presentation. I want to talk about six substantial business model shifts, six shifts uh, that we uh, as a company have seen over the past few years. Uh, and I want to dive a bit deeper into these shifts and give you some explanations and also some analogies and examples for those. First shift, it's the digital shift from analog to digital. And as an example, Netflix, the media service provider and uh, production company that creates accessibility and filters, uh, that's their value proposition basically, like with their on-demand streaming platform. But let's look back uh, really quick. H how did it all start with Netflix? It was uh, in April 1998 uh, when Netflix actually was launched as the world's first online DVD rental store. So at that time, uh, Netflix, they had 30 employees and uh, a bit more than 900 titles available on DVD. They rented out these titles, uh, these CDs, uh, and sent them via mail to their customers. But only one year later, um, Netflix went through the first substantial shift in their, in their business model. So they said, well, what if we actually, uh, what if we change our, our revenue model? So instead of a pay per rent model with rates and due dates, let's, let's actually change that and pivot into a subscription model. So basically our customers subscribe and can get uh, a, a bunch of videos uh, in, an, in a defined um, uh, period of time. And uh, yeah, nearly one decade later, Netflix, they made the real, that crucial substantial shift in their, in their business model getting away from physical DVDs. So getting away from like an analog model. And to date, uh, well, Netflix, um, it's, it's the primary business of Netflix. It's a, a subscription-based streaming service. So a digital online streaming offering um, with a library of films and TV programs, including of course their in-house productions, but whatever it is, it's all digital. You can, you can uh, select and choose um, on whatever device you're using from your smart TV, from your smartphone. You can just simply stream it online in a digital way. So with, with that digital platform, Netflix was able to actually rapidly expand into new regions, acquiring new customer bases and getting more and more subscriptions. And uh, yeah, if you compare these, uh, if you compare Netflix to other on-demand streaming services, Hulu, uh, Hulu Plus, uh, Facebook, uh, also Amazon Prime, Netflix still is the leader by, by far. With, with, with close to 170 million of paying uh, streaming subscribers, um, uh, actually um, as of the last quarter last year. 
Second shift I want to talk about, it is the platform shift. So going from a pipeline model to a platform. So for that, it's, uh, it's essential to notice that value for, for the platform model, it's not created in the, uh, it's not created in the transaction. It's the interaction uh, where the value is created. And um, an example, a very good example for this, it's Airbnb. So what is it that Airbnb does? They create a platform for people to interact. So basically, um, they're connecting travelers who are searching for a room with people, uh, with renters who actually want to rent out their room and also make an additional amount of money. And Airbnb, they have more stays and more room bookings than all the other hotel brands taken together without even owning any assets. Another example in this, uh, in this context, it's Alibaba, an e-commerce platform connecting sellers and buyers. And, and nowadays, uh, yeah, Alibaba, they have grown into a giant beast of the internet. With, they're, they're looking almost into every aspect of the internet. The third, uh, the third shift, uh, it's the services shift. So from products to services. An example, um, you might not have heard of that, Mud Jeans, offering jeans as a service. And uh, another example, uh, you can take BMW, but also uh, another uh, or two other um, German auto manufacturers, Mercedes uh, or also Audi with a silver car here in the US. So offering vehicle as a service, mobility as a service. So you don't, you as a, as a user, you do not have to take care of uh, the entire ownership model um, of all the costs that accrue uh, to ownership, to the lease, to insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So you simply, you simply rent that car for a short amount of time um, and you just simply go from A to B, drop the car, get out and you're done. So just using that vehicle as a service. Next uh, pretty interesting shift, uh, it's the social shift. So from, from profit to social, or in, in other words, profit with a purpose. Um, so this means actually value is created, um, not exclusively with the shareholders, moving beyond profit. That's the, that, that's the crucial aspect uh, for, for the social shift, moving towards social. I wanna talk about two examples here. First one, Patagonia. Um, it's a great example in this context, in my mind. So Patagonia, they're committed to a sustainable business. They want to create social responsibility in terms of profit orientation. And another one, um, well, as you can read on the slide, exceptional heart and soul, it's Tom's shoes. So the company of, uh, of Blake McCoskey, he, he's a young entrepreneur um, who actually put corporate social responsibility into the core of, of uh, Tom's shoes business models. And uh, he, he launched the, the campaign together with his team, of course, one for one. One for one, meaning that Tom's, they donate one pair of shoes to someone who is in the need of shoes, who's not able to buy a pair of shoes for every pair that their customers buy. So it's an, in, in my mind, it's an outstanding example for social impact and also uh, for, for creating um, corporate social responsibility. Um, it's another shift uh, I want to talk about, it's the circular shift. And you see that also happening with a lot of companies nowadays from, from a singular model to circular. So value is actually created in, in, uh, in reducing waste and also in reusing um, uh, the means of manufacturing uh, in, in recycling um, whatever they do. And uh, the value propositions the customer are paying for, it's it's that circ circularity. Customers are paying, for instance, for plastic roads, but also for apparel made out of plastic bottles. An example here, it's Adidas, and uh, they launched that campaign, Adidas Parley. So shoes that are actually made from re recycled ocean plastic. And um, of course, uh, another good thing that Adidas at that time did, they also plucked in technology like uh, 3D manufacturing technologies, 3D printing to be able to produce the shoes in a great manner and also to handle those new kinds of materials like ocean plastic to create shoes um, and also to be able to scale. And another example, um, it's Signify, uh, like, uh, the companies formerly known as Philips Lighting. So Signify, they're the world leader in lighting and they provide their customers with high quality, qu high quality with an energy efficient lighting. And uh, in detail, um, Signify, what they do is they define, uh, they design lighting solutions in a circular way. What they do is they offer services such as disassembly of the light bulbs, reuse, refurbishing, 
and then also parts harvesting for a longer lifetime recycling. So they're really interested in creating that circular, that circular model, circular lighting with that responsibility, like uh, taking care of, of our environment and also having that sustainability aspect in, their, in, in, in the core of their business model. Last shift I want to talk about, it's the exponential shift, maybe like one of the most interesting, um, moving your business model from a linear to an exponential business model. And uh, so, so ultimately, what does that mean? It's like having non-linear growth, and you might heard of it, well, hockey stick, hockey stick growth. Of course, that's everyone, what every entrepreneur would be in, interested in, um, like actually uh, getting to, towards a, uh, a hockey stick growth for, for his or her company. And a few examples here, Uber with their exponential platform, connecting, connecting drivers who offer a ride to, to riders who are in the need of right um, in, uh, in exchange of money. And also, again, uh, the Netflix example, it's a great example for an exponential business model. So Netflix, uh, they're almost in every, crunk, in every country in all over the world nowadays. And, um, uh, but what, what, makes them, uh, what makes Netflix actually uh, exponential? What characterizes their exponentiality? So it's their, it's their exponential algorithms that stand out amongst, uh, amongst all those other streaming platforms. So Netflix, they've gone through a massive global expansion. Uh, just in seven years, they expanded to 190 countries um, with their on-demand streaming platform. And the most interesting part is their platform, it caters to the diverse needs of their customers globally. So uh, in their algor algorithms, um, they recommend you as like individual recommendations uh, based on whatever, whatever you have watched last time. They recommend you like this or that movie might also be interesting for you. So it's really that, that algorithm um, that actually creates that, what I, what I said before, that hyper-individualized custom experience. And uh, of course, as a subscriber, you can watch your favorite shows uh, on whatever device, whatever smart, di smart device it is. You can watch it anywhere, anytime. And even while airborne, you just download uh, that movie or that TV show, and you can even watch it when you do not have any internet connection at all. Yeah, there, there's many, many more examples uh, for those for all those different um, um, business model shifts I was talking about before. Uh, yeah, but you might ask yourself, how can I prepare me? How can I prepare my business to also move toward the edge of innovation to prepare that shift? Well, certainly um, looking at these shifts again in a, in a bit more depth might be a good start uh, to, to get toward uh, or like to get also some impressions how to use that and reflecting to what extent some of these elements I was talking about uh, might be relevant so that you can actually also initiate a shift for your company, for your business model. Um, yeah, all these shifts uh, and, and many more, they will be part of, of our next book um, that is scheduled for the end of summer this year, The Business Model Shift. And if you're interested, uh, you can already pre-order that book in Amazon. It's already out there. Um, but as I said, it's uh, going to be scheduled and available by the end of summer this year. And you can also find uh, way more content regarding business model shifts but also content about everything that I was talking in this presentation before on our website, Business Models Inc. And of course, uh, just keep in mind, uh, reading alone, it will never do the job for you. It's about creation. It's really about actively creating your strategic shifts to go beyond, to move toward that edge of innovation I was talking about. So I'm now at the end of my talk today, and uh, I would like to open it up for questions. Thanks for listening in. And uh, yeah, Danielle, handing it over to you again. Um, the first book, uh, the business model generation, um, it depends, uh, it depends exactly what you want to do. If you want to understand and really read about, uh, the entire notions of the business model canvas, uh, really like deep dives, um, then, uh, definitely, uh, yeah, it's, it is a, a, a good resource, but, um, I would actually say it's better, uh, if you read, uh, if you read, uh, through, um, the, the yellow book, um, the design of better business. So for that reason, um, it's more the practical version of the book. Um, it's, you can use those uh, simple, uh, simple frameworks in small, smaller snippets that you can actually use for your innovation needs. So I would always recommend going with that second book, the yellow book, Design a Better Business. Uh, but still, I mean, like it's good literature, also the first book, but uh, my personal recommendation would always be uh, the, the yellow book 
and also that's available on Amazon. And also um, there is the website designerbetterbusiness.com. So um, you can also get a lot of, even read like online for free through a lot of those things. Um, well, next question, uh, co-innovation with other startup startups without uh, losing our own IP, uh, no, with your uh, own IP. Well, in the end, uh, what we did do before or beforehand uh, in terms of the co-innovation that I've shown you with uh, GE Ericsson, for instance, but also those those uh, five, uh, five party co-innovation, they had the IP, the legal contracts together, they had them in place beforehand, and they were clear that uh, in the end, whatever comes out of that, uh, it's going to be joint ventures. So if you co-innovate with other startups, um, well, you can always, of course, have any like a non-disclosure agreements. Uh, you can you can work on that. You should never just do it, run it, and then whatever comes out of that, uh, you go into huge disputes after. So I definitely, I definitely recommend to have like any agreement in place beforehand. Um, all right, so if there's no more questions, then thank you, Toby. And I'm going to switch the screen. And check back in with us at 150. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.